it wasn't just some old white guy writing it anymore. It was actually a part of the world that we live in. When we watch TV and we read books, all we want is to be reminded of all the problems of our world. Before the rings of power, there were the Silmarils. Before Sauron, there was his master Morgoth. Before Aragorn and Arwen, there was the rings of power. Join us as we explore the rings of power with your hosts from the OneRing.com, Jonathan Watson and Michael Grumbine. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Exploring the Rings of Power, our favorite show that uh, that has graced us, I don't know, since since the films, at least. Right. And uh, Well, and definitely best show of the last five years. Oh, so far we, none. So we thought um, maybe we could... Come to you guys with an episode where we look back since um, this is we are coming up on the release of season two of the Rings of Power, mm -hmm. which I mm -hmm. cannot wait for. And right. and we're just um, we thought we'd, we'd go over some of our top moments in the first season of the Rings of Power. As well as some top characters. I mean, it's you know, it's a the first day of a new quarter the first day of the fourth month. So I thought it would be a great time to do that. Uh, it's 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 a new season, right? Spring is here, April has come, and we're going to jump into the Rings of Power with both feet first. I mean, we do it every week, but even more this week because because the news is going to start. It's going to it's got to start rolling in. It's been it's been months, almost years. I am waiting. Anything. Checking we're, my feed for five waiting. minutes. So before we jump into all those great details on the Rings of Power from your Tolkien Super fans, Jonathan Watson and Michael Grumbine. I wanted to tell you, you should get a membership to the OneRing.com. By going to the OneRing.com slash member, you get our extended podcast. The first month is free. It's $4 a month. And in that extended podcast this week, we're going to be talking about in more detail the other scenes of the Rings of Power that we're hoping for to see in episode, in episode, in season two. We've gotten eight full episodes, of course. But this is episode two. Season two, which is coming this fall, they haven't released a, a, a date yet, but we're going to go into more details about what our favorite upcoming episodes are. See, uh, uh, upcoming scenes are going to be probably Tom Bombadil. Um, uh, yeah. Also, you know, I was thinking recently that about how much Tolkien loved song and music, mm, and I think Rings mm -hmm. of Power has has kind of a perfect opportunity here now that we have kind of got to know the character of Sauron a little bit yes. better. I'm I'm looking forward to what they can do making giving Sauron a couple musical numbers maybe some um, some, some dude, song I mean he that needs be... at very least he needs poetry yeah I know um, exactly exactly I mean, black speech imagine? poetry I mean well does doesn't he come up with the ring verse I mean maybe that's how we do it right maybe maybe right. it's like you know he's just he's just right. rapping I mean and he's coming up with some right. verse he's well dropping. I mean they did have a song on the soundtrack by Barry McCreary that uh, is so memorable everybody remembers the ring verse song yep. that they came out with in the soundtrack. All right. All right. So become a member of the wonder.com slash member. And uh, you can become a super fan of the rings of power too, by going there, just like Harrison, Adam, Lynn, and rich who give above and beyond become sponsors. In fact, you can actually go to the wonder.com slash Patreon now to use your Patreon membership to become a member. It's a dollar more at $5 a month. You get all the same perks. Uh, we're still finalizing all the setup with that, but, uh, but if, if you just want to use Patreon because it's super easy, and the reason it's a dollar more is because Patreon takes more of our hard-earned moolah, and uh, it's not nice of them. So that's why we built it all on our website, so we're not beholden to anybody else. Anyway, Patreon and membership at the com slash member, the com slash Patreon. Okay, guys, The Rings of Power, probably the best show I've seen in years, and I wanted to just go back to some of the stats from the show that I think indicate it's ascendancy in the pantheon of television shows right and that is it got an 83 yep. percent on rotten tomatoes i don't know if any show has ever gotten more than an 83 percent that's like a b that's really good pretty that's better than here pretty top tier like i've never gotten higher than that in school so that's that's top tier on metacritic it got a 71 i mean that's a little bit lower but it's still super high i mean has anything gotten better than the 71 i think i think peter jackson's Look, films probably had like a 65 or something like that it's their it, they're critics right so that's it's they're gonna yeah they're gonna they have to they fi have to find all the yeah, ding things a little bit yeah. i mean if you go there i'm sure that the uh uh the the, the viewership numbers are going to be far higher for that they're probably going to give it far better ratings if you if you go to metacritic and, and i mean I, I doubt the bible would get an 80 percent on metacritic so <laughs> yeah yeah well the bible we don't need that. Who needs to look backwards anyway? As we'll find out because of what Ellen had told us. Um, the past is dead, Michael. Who That's needs right. Michael, right? Uh, let's also let's also remember that 25 million people watched the first episode. 
Well, they sampled it. That was the word that that Amazon used. They sampled it, but who Look, doesn't like a good sample? I attention a, spans a are low samples. these days. Yeah, like, yeah. Can't... Samples are great, and I'm sure of those 25 million people, many finished it. Um, I I know I did. It's great. That's yeah. one. That's one. That's one out of you know. That's a certain percentage. In fact, speaking of percentages, out of those that watched the first episode, maybe. I mean, watch, not sampled, but out of those, a full 37% finished the show. That's huge. Can you imagine the amount of people, hundreds, dozens, thousands, um, that finished the show? And and uh, 30, that's a great batting average. It it's uh, that's huge. It, oh, exactly. Like that's a great point. As far as batting averages go, <laughs> that's right. like that's, heavy right there. 37%. They, so 370. Yeah. One of 370. And, and they never struck out on the show either. <laughs> that's a, <laughs> you like that joke. okay who can't remember also the theme to the rings of power the most memorable theme probably in any oh. television show ever um i can't I like it. i've always tried to remember the original like 1960 batman theme like but uh but uh da, ba. I, don't, I don't remember how that batman theme goes but the the rings of power theme i Easy like to remember. no problem right you got it right michael go go for it go for it yeah, it's so memorable. I mean, we love so it. Good. It's so good. It's so like, good. I, it's, it's, I, I have to go back and listen to it. Super catchy. Now. Like, yeah, yeah, I know. I just like listening right to you hum it. It's, it's like uh, it's like the rays of sun shining on me from the heavens beyond. It was, it's, yeah. I love that theme. Or, I love that theme. Or the light of the Silmarils. Oh, the light of the Silmarils. That's a little teaser. A little teaser. Our favorite scenes in the Rings of Power we're about to, to jump into. And uh, I don't know, you tell me when it's time, but... Well, I, I just, I've got a couple more things to mention, okay. or at least right, one right. more. And that's the acting, right? The acting is tremendous. They were nominated for six Emmys for the show. It wasn't it wasn't for the acting. None of it was, it was actually just technical Emmys. But, but if it wasn't for the acting, those costumes would not have looked anywhere near as good as they looked yeah, I mean, on the look, show. Costumes by themselves on the ground, yeah, useless. Right. So, right. so and, it's and, the actors that really yeah. brought it home. And with those costumes, they they the they used the best printing presses possible to make these costumes. It was incredible. Like they looked so almost realistic. My home printer could barely do as good as those. Some of those yeah. Numenorean yeah. costumes, the armor, the Numenorean. And you spent a few hundred on that printer. It was when well, you told me about it. It was like you were spending how much on a printer, Michael? Really. Like, the the printing is uh the, the costumes amazing right emmys they got they got them all i i think they i don't know if they won but they were nominated for them right they got all the nominations yeah so and that's what that's what really counts so let's jump into a couple of things and that's going to be well three things like you said earlier the favorite scene the favorite character and let's go over the most memorable lines from the show so we're going to start with personally my favorite scene and that's uh when we learn of the conflict, well, we learn why there is such deep conflict between the elves and the men, and what drives the distrust, and I mean, why that's there. This is a pillar, right, of of all great all great shows. You got to yeah. have that tension. Got to explain the tension. Where does it come? Right. From? Why Why would the Numenorians actually help the elves? Like, there, the, the, you have to set this up, and yep. so they do Motivation. it in perhaps the most expert way. Again, by not looking backwards but by looking forwards by looking to our time what what influences us here in our world the most um and i'm going to go through this kind of line by line and so here's the first part of that scene mate attacks four guildsmen and miriel has her up for tea probably she called the elf into punisher or to ask her for orders <laughs> yeah so we learn right away that there's this tension between the elves and that right they know that the elf and her mate, that's what he says, it's a little hard to understand right there, but he says her mate came in and attacked, right? So there's immediately this tension. They set that up right away, done incredibly well. That writing is tremendous. Uh, let's keep going. <laughs> and while the elf whispers poison in our queen's ear, who's speaking for us? Right. And that, that harkens back to like sort of our time, like who's speaking for us here in our world? And we always look for those leaders that are speaking for us. And these elves, they don't trust Muriel. They see them talking to Galadriel. So we not only have the tension between the elves and the men that's starting to build, but between the citizens of Numenor and their royalty. Um, they don't they don't find them worth their time. Right? They, they, if, if they're going to give elves all this power, then why would they trust their royalty? Elf ships on our shore. Elf, elf workers. Ships. 
taking your trades. Right. And what is more real than that? What is more real than the elf workers taking your trades? I mean, this is this is the political drive of of almost this election right now is like what's most important? It's it's those immigrants, those those immigrants coming in, taking all of our jobs here. And so when the elves come in, when they see that one super powerful five foot four elf come in and obviously she's there to take her, their jobs because she's wearing the trade, you know, jerk. OK, but she's there to take their jobs and they see that one elf and that's all that they need. That's all that they need because they know the evil of elves. They've seen them for thousands of years, maybe tens of thousands of years in Numenor already. I think, I think that's what Tolkien wrote. Uh, so yeah. So the elves taking their jobs. That's it's important. All right. Taking their trades. It's not really their jobs, right? Their trades. So, uh, I guess that would be butchering. That would be, uh, metalworking. That would be livery stuff, right? That would be, uh, scribes. All the elves are going to come in and do it. Yeah. Yeah, I just I I found the writing here awesome because it's showing how perceptive this man is that he just mm. from one example totally of, of an elven woman he can see he can see how it's going to go he can see that you know this is the end for tradesmen on Numenor and yeah. I mean like what foresight yeah yeah all right let's keep going workers who don't sleep don't sleep don't tire don't tire don't age like how can you compete with that. Right. So this I say the queen's either blind or an elf lover. So imagine, imagine going up against a workforce that doesn't sleep, that doesn't tire, that doesn't age. Um, of course I mean, they're gonna of, hire elves, right? Like all, every single industry is gonna hire an elf. Why would they hire like, a human? Elves are like the AI of of you know middle earth. Wow, Earth's. that is insightful. I mean, wow. I need, hold I mean, on. it wasn't me. Like the rings of power, they led me right That's to amazing. it. That's... Yeah. The elves are like the AI, right? They're, they're the ones that, and, and they will probably, jobs. yeah. They'll Never probably... sleep. Yep. Never eat. Yep. Wow. I, it, and it, it strikes me that, you know, this is what we're up against here in our world with these immigrants that come in and they don't sleep and they don't eat either. And they know, we know where they're going to take our jobs here. That's that's really what they're talking about. It's so, kind of a combination, right? They're it, like it is. Ill, I mean, illegal yeah. AI is what this space. Illegal is. AI. The elves are illegal AI. That's yep. hmm, seems that's right. Deep. That's deep. All right, let's finish this scene off. Just like her father, elf lover, elf lover, elf lover. Right. There's nothing worse in the world than to be called elf lover. Um, and I like I can't count the times since this yeah. episode. That I've just found myself sort of waking up and right. chanting elf lover. Elf lover. Well, it's it's so sad. So it reminds me of all those scenes we see the MAGA lovers here that they go to the Home Depot and they start chanting chanting immigrant lover. That's all you know, immigrant lover, immigrant lover. And when you see those scenes on Twitter and TikTok, true. it's it really hits me here. And to see that represented now in Middle Earth uh, is so powerful. It is it it strikes me to the core that. Uh, we need to be aware. And so now we have this tension. We have this utter tension between men and elves that are set up that the elves are coming not just to defeat them, but to actually, you know, grind them under the heel of their economy, right? They're going to take over. They're not just going to like destroy it. No, it's like they're insidious. They're coming in. They're just going to take their jobs and push them all out. There'll be nobody left to vote for their uh, for their queen. This is just prophetic. This That scene was so prophetic of the, our modern world. This is... Yeah. I mean, yeah, once once that scene hit, genius. I was I was I was all in on the show. Um, Geniuses. Because I knew that uh, it was speaking to me. Uh, and it wasn't just it wasn't just some old white guy writing it anymore. It was actually a part of the world that we live in. And when we when we watch TV and we read books, all we want is to be reminded of all the problems of our world and how we need to deal with them. Um, and so when we saw when I saw that in the Rings of Power, I thought, wow, what great writers, what great showrunners, what great actors. What a great way to make us buy into the show by relating it to the problems of our world. It was it was tremendous. It was tremendous. So that's, that, what, I'm, Michael, that's what I'm looking for yeah. from, from when I when I want a Tolkien show. Me too. I, right. That's right. like I want it, all this the stuff that I'm getting in my right. news. I want it to match. I want like go to my go to Tolkien or you know Rings of Power, which is let admit it might be it's, slightly slightly better than Tolkien. Yeah, okay. but maybe right. improve I'm, upon. I'm, okay. Like, yeah. Uh, look, I'm not disagreeing. I'm not Tolkien's disagree. great. Tolkien's great. Tolkin's great. Everyone can be improved on. Right, so. right, right. No, I mean, right. he said that people should, you know, start playing with. I think he mentioned that somewhere where other 
writers hand, should change what he wrote. I think I think we're his almost verbatim. Other, other hands, other and, uh, hands, and and minds, or other hands and uh, I don't know. Politics? I think he said I don't know. I, think, I don't know. I whatever said, it was, yeah, no, ch change it. Do something better with my stuff because you know, yeah. as we grow as a society, we only get better. Things never get worse. It's a, it is a push toward the future that is you know. That's what Star Trek is, right? We we will get there eventually, and everything you know. La this year is better than last year because, as humanity, we only get better. We grow in our in our love of the human, and um, well, all, look, if, if all we if focus he, on is the econ economics and plot politics of things, then we will always get better. If Tolkien didn't say that, he should have. So he should have. That's, that's Absolutely. what I. Okay. Well, all right. That my, was my may my not be as good as yours. Okay, but all right. but as everyone knows. You know, one of the things that's often said about Tolkien is that he wasn't just writing, a, you know, a, a fantasy story. He was making a mythology. And so there's so many mythological elements of Tolkien. And I have to say that of all of the, um, the, 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 the entirety of the first season, I think it was episode five, had my mm -hmm. favorite moment, which was this piece of mythology. And what I love here is that the Rings of Power writers, they, they're showing their real genius because they don't just take the world that Tolkien created and put a great story in there with great actors and themes and bringing it back, like you said, to our world today, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, one-to-one -one connections. That's, like, that's great. But they also took a hand on the myth mythological elements. And frankly, you know, we know a lot, if you read the Silmarillion, as we have and gone through it, you know that the Silmarils are a major part of Tolkien's histories and mythology. And, but clearly the Ring Riders of Rings of Power saw that there was probably some things that could have been improved on. So they took their mm -hmm. hand, they, they mm -hmm. took a hand at mythology. And so in, season, in episode five, we have um, what, uh, the king, the king Gilgalad calls the song of the roots of Hithail gear and or uh, I might have mispronounced it. Hithail gear. It doesn't. Uh, anyway, the language doesn't really. Whatever. Matter. Like really matter. his. Yeah. It's just confusing. The Elvish is a confusing no. language. Yeah. Um, so so he matter. says some gobbledygook. But anyway, so so there's he 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 has Elrond re to you know recount this mythology. And it's it's awesome because very subtly the writers, the Rings of Power, change elements of what Tolkien mm -hmm. had probably fairly crudely written down, and so we we actually find out that in this you know in Rings of Power that there's you know a Silmaril that maybe was unaccounted for, or perhaps there was one of the Silmarils that we, you know were accounted for, but somehow it ended up in this different part of the world a thousand miles away um and it doesn't matter again they're allowed to rewrite whatever look, they want. That's, matter. that's the it power of imagination right so mm -hmm. so they retell mm -hmm. this tale and this is going to explain to us from the silmaril from the idea of the silmaril fourth silmaril out of the three or something and they they were going to explain how uh, mithril comes about this mm -hmm. uh, wondrous mm -hmm. metal that tolkien has a part of as part of his legendary well and here so let so, me know when you're ready. I want me to show yeah, you. Yeah, let's, so, yeah. so we're going right, to start hearing about this mythological tale. And I'm, we'll stop it at different points and I'll talk about just the brilliance of the elements they put in. Here we go. On one side fought an elven warrior. The heart is pure as Manway. What do you think about that? that what okay. a great line. With the heart is pure as Manway. Okay, so this is awesome. So, and right before this scene, we do, you know we we can only take certain cuts because we don't want to get deemed for copyright. Yeah, but, copyright. But right. but they you know they make clear, uh, Elrond makes clear that this is a battle that had occurred in the Misty Mountains. Now, we all, all may be thinking to ourselves, well, mm. the Silmarils, the history of the Silmarils, that took place in Beleriand, which is you know under the ocean, thousands of miles away. Mm -hmm. um, that's where the there was any fighting between El warriors and Balrogs, um, but and the Silmarils spent their time, but no, no, we have to just like open your mind and understand that this is a better story. And in this, in this, the, the elf warriors here fighting on the Misty Mountains over a Silmaril that's in a tree. Cause I mean, look, if you're gonna hide a Silmaril, mm -hmm. Seems like a good place. Right, well, and remember there was the light of the tree. So obviously you'd, where do you want to put the light of the Silmaril? In a tree. In a tree, all right. S seems to make sense. Mm -hmm. Poured all his light into the tree to protect it. Right. The other, a Balrog. Okay. Okay. Look, I know that in Tolkien we don't really have a vision of elves like like a big batteries pouring their light into things. I understand that's not really a Tolkien, but let's 
I mean, let's be real. We've all played video games. Isn't this a much better idea? Mm -hmm. If you, if the good people can actually have light that comes out of them, they can pour into things. And then we're about to see the bad guys can have darkness. They pour out of them like dark battery thing. Right. It's, it's when you think about it, it's how George Lucas improved on Lord of the Rings by calling it the light side of the force. Right. There you go. There you go. We're we're essentially, like I said, we, we get better as time progresses. And so we're taking from other things too. And so just the light side of magic here. This is what he's doing. He's pouring his light, the light side of the force of so the elves into pours it. Pours his yeah. light into this tree, still roll to the top. You here we go. Here yourself, we go. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Should I keep you, playing? I'm just, saying, I'm just saying, you may ask yourself as you're watching the scene, yeah. why would they keep a silver at the top of a tree? Why would they be fighting by pouring their light into a tree? And I would just say, look, go with it. It's this is this is the imagination. These are the this is the writing of a superior mind here. So let's go. All right. Book of Morgoth channeled all his hatred into the tree to destroy it. I mean, now, why do you think a, a Balrog would hate a tree? Because um, he, he, he channeled look, all of his hatred into the tree. Yep. I mean, look, look, this is clearly Tolkien making an ecological statement. So this is, I mean, sorry, this is the Rings of Power That's writers a wonderful point. Yeah. improving on Tolkien's. Like Tolkien, like he loved trees. We have the ants and we have the t- two trees. Like clearly, so the Rings of Power writers are just doing what they do best, which is they take what Tolkien wrote and they elevate it to the next level. So here we have evil. And what does it want to do more than anything else? Does it want to attack the elf in front of it? No, it no. wants to kill the tree. Oh man, which has the Silmaril. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I guess would get the Silmaril out. I don't know, whatever. So, so he the 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 Balrog's gonna. I mean, that, and then the elf is like, I'm gonna protect the tree. I'm right. like, I'm like super green piece or white. Piece. Totally. Wait, not white. No, no, not white. Um, no, you can't. Super, yeah, no. Super elf, light. Elf piece. Light. Light yeah. piece. Okay. Well, let's keep going. Let's keep. That you unending, lightning ensnared the tree. Okay. Okay. Bam. Stop there. All right. So this, this is genius. Okay, look. Lightning um, hits the tree. Before Tolkien lived, of course, we have one of the great authors of literature, or at least one of the great li- um, stories in literature of the 19th century, Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. Okay? And in Frankenstein, mm-hmm. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the life of the monster, Frankenstein's monster, is able to come about because of lightning. Like, this is such a classic move this is like and so the rings of power writers look they 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 see tolkien's work and they they love it but they realize it could be a bit better and so mm-hmm. let's just take mm-hmm. a little lightning you know frankenstein style let's throw in the mix so you got light from the elf and darkness from the balrog and lightning and as everyone knows if that's the kind of combination the magical formula you're going to get something really awesome like mithril and that's what i mean that's what happens forging of their conflict that uh, it's it, it's like the lightning strikes into the stone it's so i mean and the beauty of this scene too right it's it looks like the greatest video game you've ever seen I mean, it's probably just, better probably probably better probably better um like probably better than one from like 2020 but it was amazing it looked so good and uh yeah that mithril going down let's keep following the scene here if there's if you want me to stop let me know the power as pure and light, as good, as strong and unyielding as evil. Look, everyone knows that of all the things in the world that are like unyielding, it's evil that's the most mm-hmm. unyielding. Yeah. Like, uh, and and everyone knows that purity and light is good, like good. So, I mean, look, this is perfect. It's like it's it's all the immaterial qualities that Tolkien would have, of course, agreed with, and that they're put into a material thing. And he, Elrond's about, no, no, sorry, sorry, no, I want to, Gilgalad is about to say, like, the trapped light of the Silmarils. So, so this is what happens to the light of the Silmarils. Like, the idea, and frankly, let's remember, Tolkien had one of the Silmarils end up on the brow of Arendelle, end up in the stars. It's this mm-hmm. perpetual light shining down. Kind of boring, kind of boring. Mm-hmm. Look, wh- mm-hmm. how much better if the light of the Silmarils instead were trapped mm-hmm. in a metal in the bottom of a mountain and that's i mean genius. right right yeah and and it's i am um, the summer is destroyed i mean i think so right like well, it has it's, to be. Far, it, it's far better if this is the third silver it's far better than like what being thrown into an ocean like what who does that yeah like i mean this give it a reason like if you don't have a purpose for anything like there was no reason for him to throw it in the ocean look, it was just sort of a random thing that uh, one of those elf 
guy, sons of Faya something did. I yeah, and look, better. look, everyone knows like underground, you know, inside of a mountain, way more interesting than at the bottom of the ocean. Like, mm -hmm. it's not like there's ever been books written about the the, the ocean is boring. Look, yeah. it's not. There's, there's nothing, nothing there. interesting. We've we've found there. out everything we know about the ocean. There's no more. No. There's no okay. more. The so so mouse. so I love this. This is and and this is genius. And and you know, here we are. So so they they show they're showing their mythological chops. They can take mm -hmm. what Tolkien gave them, probably you know B plus grade stuff. And yeah. and they can and they can raise it up and, and bring it to a new you're, level. You're so, pretty generous with that B plus, but I'll, well, I I'm I look, I like there. Tolkien, so you know B okay. plus sometimes. Right. You know, you know what but I this, love? Yeah, a, what a I love. What I love about the scene is that it, it encapsulates what Tolkien said in um, that fairy fairy essay he did, where he talks about how on your imagination. Dust, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He talks about how your imagination on fairy dust is so much better than anything else that's that's done that and here they're using their imagination so they're they're taking that idea that imagination is more powerful than anything else and using it to give us something that's more powerful a more, more powerful tv show than has ever been put on screen right you know no. we're not worthy that's, all right that's that's what it's, i got it was so. wonderful all right yes. let's get into then these are two, two favorite scenes let's get into our two favorite characters uh why don't you kick off michael because mine is is perhaps a, a, a little it's a little more central to the show, but okay. Yours is all right. Name. All right. All right. Yeah. So, so, um, I'm, I'm, when I was thinking about, you know, who is my favorite character from Rings of Power? Um, there are a lot of choices, uh, because there's so many good characters. I mean, it's hard to think of a bad one, actually, a poor choice. Um, I almost chose that guy from the marketplace that you were talking about. Mm. Then, I, then I realized I couldn't remember his name. So, probably not the best choice. Um, so, I, I but I was going through the characters and I realized um I have to give it up for um the leader of probably the best adaptation of I know we're not supposed to say it, the best adaptation of hobbits, hobbits, hobbits that 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 you know rings of power did. We're technically supposed to call them Harfoot, so yeah, I get it, I get it. There we go, there we go. So so um the leader of now the reimagined hobbits in this, you know, Harfoot in this, um, in the, in rings of power are, they, they're kind of cool because Tolkien, um, in envisioned this small people that doesn't, that don't like to be seen. And they, they love the simple things of life and they stay away from the big folk and they, mm -hmm. you know, in the Shire and everything. But honestly, I always thought reading Tolkien, it's kind of, you know, it's a little stupid. I know, I know people, we, mm -hmm. here's why, here's why. Look, bear with me. Um, if you are a race of people that doesn't like to be seen, um, why on earth would you have a culture that stays in the same place? Like that's just kind of silly. Right. So, so right. instead the rings of power writers, they took a care, they took, a, they took a, the hobbits and they made them like what really Tolkien should have written, which is here's the people that are nomadic. So they move about so they can, mm -hmm. they can hide and they can stay away from the big folks. This is great. Um, so the head of the tribe of Harfoots is name is Sadak. And um, this is him right here in like full regalia. It's awesome. I love this sort of religious regalia that he has. It's, uh, I, it's inspiring. Mm -hmm. I kind of want like them to lean a little mm -hmm. more into this religion because I might be. I'm like this might be something that attracts me. I like that, what what do they believe? This is awesome. Something to do with birds' nests. But and, yeah, anyway, he is not my favorite character because of that. Like mm. you know, awesome. No, costume, that's reason enough. Cost me aside. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. There's so many things to pick about his character which I find um, inspiring. But I'm gonna focus on three. So so for the three. The three things that I chose, reasons that I chose that Sadok was my favorite character. Um, he has, he, you know, he's the leader of this tribe of nomadic hobbits. And they, they're moving continuously. And you know what I really like about the way they wrote his character is that Sadok, unlike a lot of leaders who are afraid to make the hard choices in life, Sadok does not, um, does not shy away from the hard choices. Um, he does what it takes to lead his people. And let, let me give you a couple examples. So in the movie, in the, in the show, um, you know, one of the rules about this Hobbit culture is you're, you're, you're always on the move and, um, you know, they stick together and they're out for each other unless, unless, and this is, you know, 
a reality of their world unless you're a little slower than the rest of them and you get mm -hmm. then you get left behind and you die um and you know that's harsh but as a leader of this tribe he has to uphold these rules and make sure that you know their their society ha congeals it has that structure which is so necessary where they just and and so he is willing to leave behind um, you know, his, the people of his tribe who are just a little slower or maybe their cart gets uh, breaks a wheel or something and, and they're left behind. Like that's that's harsh. That's justice. That's like fair, harsh, but fair. I, that's what I call it. Um, but, you know, it's really interesting because a good leader has to both have justice and mercy. Right. So so there isn't it isn't just that just side of them that we see. We also see that in as they're on on the trail, Sadok is their leader who brings out the stories to them um, at night that they can, they, and, and, and little ditties and poems where they can um, talk about those hobbits they've had to leave behind and they can kind of, you know, lift their hearts. So he's got like the justice side and the mercy side. So he's being merciful to his people by, by you know, um, lifting them up and giving them something to laugh about, like, you know, the hobbits weight or how slow they were or something like mm -hmm. that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and and that humor and mirth that he brings to the, like the core part of it, Hobbit culture, and and just really really yeah. shows his him yeah. his. I, I mean, I'm sure things. I'm sure you would have picked if you could have all the all the Harfeet, the Hobbits, sure. if you could have, but you had to pick the leader, the one who there. And, and as you say, you know, it is sad that at the end when when he when he died, well, you can't take oh. that from me. Like that's my last point. That's oh, my last sorry. Point. Okay, okay, let me okay. 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 go for it. All go right, sorry. It. But no, look for me. And maybe you got something else to say about this, but this his his role. The reason that he's my favorite character is because in the end, at the end of the season one, rings about. By the way, spoiler alert! So anyone that hasn't seen Rings of Power, what are you talking about? By now, I know I don't it, even know why you, million people watched it. Why yeah. would you be watching this show? I mean, Everybody's maybe seen it. maybe you're part of the sixty three percent that never finished. But if that's the case, then shame on you. And and you know, spoiler. Yeah. So at the end. Sadok sadly is killed and he's killed by some um you know folk of dubious gender which is another another um nod to rings of power for its diversity equity and inclusion because mm -hmm. that is what we want in our in our fantasy shows about Tolkien and yeah. so there you know he but in the la in one of the final episodes he he's he's killed and he dies and it does take him a while to die from a mortal wound like you know, there's a lot of talking and, and such but but in the end he does what I think the best leader of a tribe in his position would do, which is he, by his death, frees the various other female mm -hmm. hobbits from the patriarchy of the of the tribe. Wow. You know, he, he like he's yeah. the patriarchy. He's right. the ruler, and he's letting them go free. He's giving them that empowerment, and and he's just handing it over to them because they and they can take the reins and they can rule mm -hmm. and they whatever it is they want to do. I mean, that they're free yeah. to do whatever, right. leave yeah. or um, right. get left behind or whatever, <laughs> whatever they want. Um, and and but by by like the ultimate barrier and the ultimate sacrifice are one and the same. He kills himself or lets himself die so yeah. that he could you know free them from that from that. Mm -hmm. A, that overarching patriarchal structure genius yeah yeah wonderful work right. so yeah that, that gives, and that gives his story arc such impact right yeah. you realize in the beginning that he's the leader and maybe you're not questioning as much as you should but by the end you realize oh yeah the patriarch need we need to we that needs to be gotten rid of we need to throw that out with the bathwater. so that alone and then i also like it in his final scene how he when he when he passes right he, i think he takes a knife something to the gut yeah yep. a knife to the gut and so um but he sits down and it's, instead of like saying you know i want to spend time with my family i want to watch the sunrise and that again that's like the earth is what's important the the world around us like let's remember that more than let's remember the people around us because people were just you know we're, we're parasites on the earth even the even even all this so let's remember let's put ourselves in that position of like we are small and tiny and inconsequential in this world that where the world and the, the climate and the the impact that we have on it is so much more important i just, I just it's so it's so true he's just like i mean he's showing what's important and and you know that gives a i, I didn't even think it. that's wonderful that you said that because it gives me a new perspective on the whole leaving things behind you know leaving mm -hmm. the folks behind because look 
what's more important like when you if you have a society like they do that he leads and you're leaving people behind you're doing a, the world a favor right because since we're all parasites one then yes then you're totally you're just you're just in this continuous process of you know abandoning your own people to return to the earth and freeing the earth from their influence i mean look this is yeah. this is just yeah. a beautiful society that's i a, i feel like i should be a hard foot that's the <laughs> that's that, that don't that's we all point. don't we all yeah. So that, anyway, uh, that's female, favorite. female favorite. Harfoot, not the male. That you'd rather be a female Harfoot. Than I, yes, I, 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 I probably would. Yeah. I mean, yeah. especially yeah. at the end. Yeah. Absolutely. Hundred percent. All right. That was a great choice. I don't know if I can top this, but I have to. This is the character that most defines the series, both for the choices made, for how the the writers took a bland, boring, lifeless character that we'd seen before and changed it into a courageous relational young warrior that um that clearly we all love and that of course everybody that of course is is Galadriel and i i think that her impact on the show can't be measured by just um people who watch it Right. I mean, it's measured by how much they changed her from from who we know, because as we said before, we move forward, we get better. And so sure. I, I, the four four things about her that that's and by the way, can I just say before the mm -hmm. fourth, thank you for choosing a woman, because I, oh, uh, one, yeah. one thing I felt bad about was I choose a man. I mean, he was a man that removed himself as the patriarch. So that was good. But I mean. How, how can you yes i mean, right. like my just my heart is a flutter every time I like she came on screen. It was it was amazing. It's um, she bows to no one. Let's put it that way. There she you bows go. to no one. There you go. Especially in this here. And there are four things that set her apart from the rest of the characters. And that's one that she's now young, right? She's not this old, boring, bland, shining elf that we saw in Peter Jackson's film who really just doesn't do anything. I mean, does she have any impact on the hobbits at all? I don't think so. Like I she mean, barely talks with them. Yeah, I mean, every she makes it more right. boring. That's, yeah, that's the impact for, for sure, for sure. So, and, and so now we see that she's young, right? She's just like just like Tolkien wanted her to be brash. I think so, at least. Like she was supposed to be an Amazon, I think. Or I think that's what I mean. Tolkien like wrote. Amazons wish they were like her. This is this right. Is... Hundred percent. Who who wouldn't want to be like a five four elf of warrior kind? So she's young. She's brash. She's abrasive, um, and. And we can tell, right, she has to grow still. She has so much to learn. Uh, I think she's like at least 100 years old right now. Maybe more? Is it more? Maybe more. But anyway, she's much younger than she is in, in what we saw in Peter Jackson's movies, um, which, you know, no, I don't know how many people really like those anymore. So so that was a great thing for us to kind of attach to. Is like, she's like the rest of us. She's still growing. She's young and she needs to, you know, she needs to be less of a, a hothead in a way what a wonderful way of us to make her more approachable for, and for can i say can i say you know mm -hmm. one of the things that i have to admit i did not not enjoy from uh, from so much from the rings of power writers and they did so much right but there was an overtone as we moved through the episodes that we should be a little bit you know a little bit down or a little bit critical of her loss of temper and how she was abrasive and I just thought it's probably uncalled for because look, she, this is Galadriel. She's been around since the first age. Like, Oh, if it, is it right. really arrogance? If you actually are better than everyone else, that's what mm. I say. So, so I, I just think, I just think we should have given her the recognition and, and enough of this judgment about her, her first negative quality. So first anyway, stage. carry on. And, but one thing she has learned, right is how she she's she's a warrior now she is she is able to defeat anything that comes her way like there we go this cave troll right there is nothing that she can't do better than the men around her um and let's be honest she was at least at least as good as legolas was in the films for peter jackson right legolas what he he ran down an old font, or ran up an old font's back and like killed it and stuff and then slid down his trunk and he ran up like falling stones in the hobbit but if you feel if like if you feel that galadriel can't do that stuff 
we know that there's only one reason why you would think that the, that a woman can't do what a man like Legless would do. Uh, and that is that is your sexism and misogyny. So if you don't like a ladrill, like we know, inst- I, I instantly know the reason why. There's nothing you have to say because if if you if you like Legolas and you dislike a ladrill here in the Rings of Power, uh, that that I don't. I, I mean, I can you think of a reason why? I, that that's got to be the only reason. That's but it. I just all I have to say is Tolkien's not for you. Obviously, mm-hmm. if totally. if the if it, I'm like Rings of Power is not for you, which is you know taking Tolkien to the to eleven. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's, this is just not for you. So no. if you're that kind of misogynist, please leave. We don't want mm-hmm. your business. I mean, mm-hmm. not that we make so, any money, but, but, you know, we just still want your business. Right. And, and, and I have to say, shout out to another podcast that I heard a while back, um, on this, that's a little known podcaster, Gary from nerd Rotic, And he has this great seat. Like he points out, I've never heard he, of him. Uh, well, anyway, so you'll okay. maybe I'll be able to send you a link if he hasn't shut his channel down. Um, okay. But but you know he points out like he has this dub over with Galadriel from Peter Jackson's films where he's she's talking and she's rightly trying to point out to everyone how she killed an ice troll in less than ten seconds. Uh, yeah. Once she started fighting, of course, because you know uh, she had to call the weak from yeah. her own band. But I mean, but, look, here's the thing: they they made her. And clearly, rightfully so, the commander of uh, the north, the northern armies, and so she's commanding all six people, and she's doing a wonderful job because what does she do? Like their entire northern army that's with her of, of all six people can't defeat this troll, but all she needs is those ten seconds, and she's a yes. she's a warrior that that cannot be trifled with, and so. In lieu of that, right? I don't even know if the Numenorians knew that, but she trains the entire Numenorian army too. She actually goes in and I mean the, the army I think is like double the size of of the, the elven army at least. So we're we're looking at dozen a uh, t- does many, so many people in the army, at and least, she trains them yeah. and double digits, and, right? And she teaches them uh you, you you don't use strength, you only use your feet. I, th- I think something like that, which is clearly more important when you fight. Strength doesn't matter at all. I mean, uh, she's got courage. That's more than strength. And that's the, one of her other most important parts I'll get to in a second. And so this courage is is what drives her forward. And that's what makes her able to beat a cave troll that's probably, you know, four times her size, maybe maybe five-ish. In um, less than 10 seconds. In less that's than it. 10 seconds. In less than 10 seconds. So obviously, great warrior. Number three is that courage that she exemplifies. She comes off as somebody who will not be trifled with. Very and we learned that. Her. Number yeah. one, we talked about it, the cave troll. Number two, when she's sent to Numenor, what does she do? Does she just like not to see it? Does she just sit there and go on the boat? No, no. When she approaches Numenor, right, her courage takes over and she jumps off the ship in the middle of the ocean, thousands of miles from shore. I mean, if that doesn't take courage, Nothing, nothing does. Look, Michael Phelps got nothing. Like she could swim in ocean. Okay. Mm-hmm. This hundred percent. This is I mean, this this is what we should all aspire to. I mean, we I can't because I'm a man, but but all women should aspire to this. This is I mean, this is she, she's the role she, model. It's 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 a leap of faith in no uncertain terms. And uh that courage drives her forward because she knows who she is and the power that she has within herself to swim to shore. Um but then, uh, then we come to okay, and and you know she does other courageous things. I'm not going to get into. I think that step alone, and she's able to defeat um, when she she gets out of jail on her own in the Numenor. She does a great job there. She uh, defeats uh, the orcs on her own, pretty much uh, in um, in uh, uh, the, uh, the the with Bronwyn and Arendir right on that side there. There she, you go. She's there. She's taking over and she's making sure that everybody's safe. Right. She. She she has the courage to do the things that other people would. She drives the Numenorians in order to to go over the seas. Like her courage pushes them to create their vast army, her their vast sailing vessels, all six of them ish, and to go overseas and support. Oh, three at least three of them to go overseas and support um, that small town that is super meaningful because there's a big dam nearby that is uh is protecting them but, from. And, a, and look, you can't you can't forget right after that she defeats a volcano right because she stands up to that pyroclastic mm-hmm. blast mm-hmm. like like right in the mm-hmm. face nobody else that's 
that's like everybody else turned to cinders and and runs screaming. She doesn't. She's not scared. The courage. She has the courage to face the volcano. So right. um, I mean, yeah. look, look. Is it, if that is not the face of bravery, the face of courage. Yes. I mean, a little bit of nacho bravery. If that doesn't make you catch your breath just a little bit, yeah, and lick your fingers, then I don't know what does. <laughs> All right. So the fourth thing that is super important is look, the relationships. This, this, this. I, I mean, I have my bravery. And you have your bravery, but this is not your bravery. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> all right. The fourth thing that she does are the relationships that were established here. And I think the first one it goes, the first one I want to talk about is goes back to her jumping off the boat and meeting Halbrand, uh, perhaps the greatest new new character. Well, they Halbro, a, right? Hal, Halbro. Yeah, the, the, the greatest dude in Middle Earth. Uh, right. That, that they, these showrunners, these writers recreated out of Sauron, right? Who doesn't want to see essentially Aragorn? Sauron is Aragorn. Uh, and so they made this wonderful character of Halbrand. But her relationship with him, it it evolves into, you know, there's there's some love going on there. There's some real connection that they have until the very end when, bam, we're like, we're broken out of that relationship that they have because we find out that he's Sauron. Nobody knew. I mean, did anybody know he was Sauron? Nobody I, had a clue. I think Nobody I, sat, in the world. I, I mean, like I just stared at the screen for like right. five hours after that. I could. It was. It, I, was I felt floored. the same way here as I did when I saw the Sixth Sense for the first time or the Matrix, yeah. where all of a sudden the whole world looks different to me. That that's that's Sauron. That's like, what, I was convinced so they, that love is gone. They had fooled me. I I thought for sure that the stranger was was Sauron. Like that was mm -hmm. it was so it was genius. Yeah. They yeah. He even had his own little cabal of people who also thought they were fooled too. They thought he yeah. was Sauron. Yeah. Um so I mean look, I was I it was, it was this tremendous. was yeah. this was yeah. genius writing right here. Yeah. Yeah. They 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 brought the relationship and then just tore it apart and it tore our hearts apart. Oh. The second relationship I think that we we need to look at is her relationship with Elrond and how mm. uh she's the warrior, right? We are again leaning into what we know is better and right in today's world where where the woman is the warrior and the men are the politician architects, the ones who stay home. And so what what they did is they established the world that should be and not the world that is in a way they're making it better for us. And so the relationship between Elrond and Galadriel is, is a reversal because we know that that's better. And I feel like uh, that they really leaned into that. They made Elrond, you know, a little more soyish. I mean, a, 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 a little, a little better. Look, I was going to love that anyway. And Elrond, I, I was sure he was vegan. All right. So, so the last relationship that's that I think maybe even more than her relationship with Halbrand that defines the series is her relationship with Muriel. Because what they've done is they've set up that the most powerful relationship is the female to female relationship. And it's not, and it's a diverse relationship. And I think when we lean into that diversity of being just women, you know, because what, what is more diverse than just women, right? That is, that is diversity at its core. When you only have women that, that's that's the kind of relationship that drives the world forward. Uh, and so they have uh, they see eye to eye. And finally, she's able to convince Muriel that we've we've got to go overseas and we've got to save the people. Um, and so it's their relationship that's really driving this female to female diverse relationship is driving the plot forward without their input, without them making these decisions for Galadriel, for destroying uh, the orcs. I mean, she was there too late, and they they got the they opened the, okay. Anyway, uh, but you know, and then she saves Halbrand, and then she's essentially the one who's taking Halbrand. Right, all these decisions they drive the plot forward. But who's doing it? It's the two women, uh, the diverse. As it should be. As the diverse be. Ho homogeneous women are doing it, um, and I think that's so. These relationships are what really endear her to us. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's, I mean, who's going to argue with Galadriel and Sadok as the best characters in all of television in the last two decades, at least, uh, bigots. That's all I can bigots, think of. Misogynists, haters. Yep. Yeah. They're all that's there. It. All right, guys, if you think differently, please put your, put, put them in. Like if there's a character that you like better, uh, put it below. Let us know, like, let us know in the comments, man. We'll respond. We'll take it in. But if there's a character that's better than Galadriel, that's better than Sadok, I doubt it. But yep. you know what? I mean, aren't all the characters in Rings of Power better than everything else? So, how yep. who's going to argue? But, hey, look, argue? this is the internet. 
you're free to be as wrong as you like. Go ahead and post yeah. it, and we'll tell you why you're wrong. Yeah, 100%. We'll do that easy peasy. All right, guys. We'll go into the last part of this, which is we're going to talk about our the best and most impactful lines from the Rings of Power. So the first line we're going to talk about is from Ellen Delon. And in fact, I believe this line was from the trailer that came out in the summer of 2022. Three, two. I love three. this line. Uh, it's been so long since the show came out. It feels like it was six years ago. This line is this. The past is dead. We either move forward or we die with it. I think that's verbatim from, from Tolkien and the Silmarillion, what Ellen Dill said to somebody. Look, or it should have been. Look, or it should have been. Should've. And it, it says, like, nothing behind us matters. Everything behind us is crap, right? Just like those swords that the hobbits got in the, the Lord of the Rings. They were crap. They didn't. Anyway, they, everything, everything, everything in the past shouldn't, shouldn't take precedence over anything else. And so that's what they're saying is like, move forward. Don't worry about what's in the past. Just worry about the future and where you want to go. You know, worry about the, the, the world that we're going to create, not about the world that we're in. Because that's it is, the past. it's really nice to see progressive Numenorians. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's no. just like, and no. progressive but, elves. Like, it's just, it's just wonderful to see finally a vision of Tolkien where people just have their eyes fixed on the future and they don't care about what's gone before mm -hmm. and they don't care about mm -hmm. it. Like, it's just all about what's here and now in front of yeah. me and whatever was in the past, dead. Yeah. Recreate the world that you want. Uh, the second line is perhaps, I mean, there is nothing more profound than this. I have read the Bible. Uh, I've read the Quran. I've read all versions of the Talmud and nothing is more, more impactful in my life than this statement. Do you know why a ship floats and a stone cannot? Because the stone sees only downward. The darkness of the water, oh, the darkness of the water is vast and irresistible. The ship feels the darkness as well, striving moment by moment to master her and pull her under. But the ship has a secret. For unlike the stone, her gaze is not downward, but up, fixed upon the light that guides her, whispering of grander things than darkness ever knew. Look. I mean, it's, it's, it's the way I learned to swim. Look up, don't look down. Also, and, um, it's why I hate rocks. They can only look down. Uh, yeah, no. They're just... That's, yeah. It's, it's like when, All the rocks, all the things that go down, I mean, everything from the stones that are at the bottom of the ocean, which nobody cares about because the ocean is boring, to the rocks and stones at the bottom of a mountain, except the mithril, which... Yeah. Uh, so, but, you know, everything that is rock-related only looks down. Um, that's, that's just, I mean, it's, it's a, it's, a mind it's like, blowing. it's, it's a, it's a life maxim that if you just remember this, look up, don't look down and you won't sink in water. Right. There's, there's no way you won't succeed. Yeah. There's I almost, no way. I almost drowned at one point when I was 14 years old and I was tangled up in seaweed and mm -hmm. I was, I was out, I was out snorkeling with my family and I got a weight belt on and all this stuff and I was going down. I, I barely survived. If I had just known this lesson that all I had to do to survive was look up, you would have been perfectly fine. You would have floated right to the top. I would not have like the trauma I got yeah. from that from that yeah. incident. Like all my life would have been so right. so many therapy bills would have been right. saved by that. You know, I I I think about this uh, this phrase and I think um, it's so so it's pregnant with meaning, like with octuplets. It's I mean, so pregnant, right? But I guess it just never gives birth. But it's so pregnant with meaning. It could be, yeah, yeah. It's, Any, yeah. Because it, anything it, yeah. could be pregnant, anything. right? Anything at all, rocks that look down. I mean, I, think, I don't maybe kind of still births, right? Because they end up at the That's bottom, true. bottom yeah. of the ocean, yeah. But it's pregnant with meaning. I just there's it hasn't given birth. Okay, the last next line um, a dog may bark at the moon, but he cannot bring it down by Durin. I still haven't figured out what that means. Like, it's so deep mm -hmm. that I'm just, I, I just dogs barking at the moon yeah i mean why why are they barking i keep Do... yeah the depth the depth it's, it's i i feel like that um they are on such a level above us that why even try to understand it 
I feel like I'm a little bit of that stone from the previous line. I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, maybe I can look up a little bit. No, no, I keep looking at it. Maybe I can look but, up. But isn't that what makes the show great? Is like we can keep musing on these phrases that are so deep mm. and we can come up maybe one day with a meaning for them. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. I mean, maybe season two. Season two, they're going to reveal in season two. Why Why he can't bring it down. I, I, I mean, hope they bring the dog back that Sparky yeah, in the moon in yeah, season two. Me too. Yeah, maybe he'll bring it down. Uh, le- next line. Um, and this comes from, I think, uh, it's Bronwyn. Okay. And um, this line, I, I think it's it's a line that they came up all on their own, is beautiful, and has, has, again, deep meaning. In the end, this shadow is but a small and passing thing. There is light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. Find the light, and the shadow will not find you. I mean, w- can you imagine being the person who came up with that line and how profound that that, that is? It's chills. Um, and and like that that line can never can never be copied by anyone. It's so good. Nobody would ever like dare to copy a line that that has such meaning think, like that. I think that episode is going to live as like the top of what Tolkien could have been. Could have written. Uh, he could have done that. Could have. But I mean, he, like he started. He started. Gave us a little world and stuff. But but to have a line like that at the end, like just so 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 profound i i i I, I wish i wish he would have done it it would have made the lord of the rings better if he would have put that line in it yep he should have done it i mean and i've read lord of the rings at least once so i think like i would have known if that's like half a time more than i have so yeah awesome Uh, awesome i i I, I, i'm so glad that they they wrote that line again the respect for the writers that they come up with this stuff on their own is uh is 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 peak level they should be peak level education here yeah all right next line um, <clears throat> where there is love, it is truly. Re- oh, let me let me get this right because it's so good. Where there is love, it is never truly dark. Because like we learned, love and goodness are light. Earlier, right? They they established that with the mithril that there is a light right. and goodness come together. So where there is love, which is good, it can't be dark. That's what they're saying. That's what Elrond did. But since the mithril is made of darkness too, then where there's mithril, there can't be love. Which might explain mm. why Disa and her husband had such marital troubles, besides oh. his, his besides his misogyny, of course. But yeah, I never thought yeah. about that. That's yeah. like it's the mithril, the darkness in the mithril can't be love. Okay, got it, got it. Like another well, one know, of those connectors that. Yeah, was, I mean, you know why they have marital troubles? It's because Durin's the the king. He's going to be the king, and Disa really should be in that role. And we know that that's the right thing to do. And he's not right. doing it. That's that's where all the trouble comes I mean, from. Maybe he'll get there in um, season two. Maybe. Yeah. And for some reason, he still loves her, and she still loves him. I don't get it, but it's profound. It's profound that that love and goodness are light, and it casts out the stark shadows in Khazad Doom. Because it would, you know, if everybody just loved in Khazad Doom, they wouldn't need to put any flames on sconces anywhere. It would just be light all the time. All the time. If if they just open their hearts, but you know, dwarves, most of them just look like men, and that's that's I think that's their problem. Yeah. All right. Last line, and we're gonna stick with the we're gonna stick with the uh, dwarves here. Uh, and, and you know, it's a little funny, but man, it's profound. It's give me the meat, and give it to me raw. <laughs> yeah. Right. It gives you the shivers, and the reason, the reason that I find it so. Like it, it stuck with me. This was at the very end of the the season. And it stuck with me is that when you when you burn meat, right? It it becomes smaller, so you're not getting everything that the meat has, um, and you probably already cut it up, so it's in smaller pieces. So when it's raw, it's not in real. It's probably not cut up. Cut up. It's probably straight from the straight from the cow, straight from the the bull, straight from the rabbit, the coney. Uh, and so this line of give me the meat and give it to me raw, right? What a profound way of saying, like, tell me everything you know. And uh, I started using that in my, in my, in my, in my interactions, <laughs> in my interactions with my wife, where I just say, give me the meat and give it to me raw when I need information. That's, that's all she needs to hear. And when I say that, boom, like we were on the same page, give me the meat. Give it to me, Ron. That is, I say, that's that's really really deep. I never ever would have thought of that. Um, <laughs> but but I, I do have to say the one thing that like when I hear that line, what I recognize is that is they're trying to show us what deep friends 
you know, Durin and and mm. Elrondar. And as we talked about earlier in this episode, um, you know, we know Elrond's a vegan. So when Durin is asking him to give him the meat and give it to him raw, he's he's lifting the burden um, of the meat that's been foisted upon his friend. And he's he's just taking it to himself because he loves his friend so much. So I mean, like that's all I got out of it was the, like the vegan you know, yeah. Yeah. dynamic. No, that's a good point. That's so, a good point. What a good, what a friend, what a friend. Right. And you notice it's, it's not the elves saying it, it is the, the dwarves because the elves are the light, they're the good. And so they would mm -hmm. never eat meat raw. Dwarves live in darkness. So, yeah. you know, if you're going to have to put meat somewhere, give it to the dwarves. Give it to the dwarves, give it to them raw. Wow. What a, what an episode. I feel like, man, I just want to go back and watch all 10 hours of the show again. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it tonight. Yeah. I'm not even going to sleep. Straight through. Yep. Like how how would how would anybody ever fall asleep during this show? It is it is action packed with the most amazing vocabulary and phrases and lines put to the small screen. I just like you you never fall asleep. All right, everybody. Yep. No show deserves the small we're, screen more than this one. We're going to uh, jump into our extended edition. We're going to talk about why we did this episode uh, and the the things that we truly love and dissects a little bit more into. What makes the rings of power tick ish? Right. And tick. especially why it took us so long to do this episode. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We should have done it a long time ago. Tick, 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 tick. All right. So if you want to become a member and hear that, go to the slash member. It's free for the first month, $4 a month after that, or to go to the slash Patreon and you can use your Patreon account where it's a buck more at $5 because Patreon takes their pound of flesh. And we'll see you in Discord where you can uh, comment on this wonderful, wonderful show. So we'll see you on which, the other side. Which we can only afford to do once a year. So Once a year. Live probably on the, the first day of the fourth month of the, of the year, probably. Somewhere around there. They, they've got the joke already, Jonathan. Yeah. We can Happy start. April Fool's Day, everybody. <laughs> we'll see you on the other side. <laughs> Bye, freeloaders. <laughs> It's so bad, dude. Oh, man. Okay. Oh, Nacho Brave Ears, look your fingers, man. We're going off the deep end. Okay. Oh, this is okay. Oh. All right.